Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, part of what we were discussing last time it was this notion of reducible error. And admittedly, I'm just kind of going to ramble for a bit here. So we saw that reducible error is reduction of the gap between our estimate and a true function by implying improved methods. And the question someone brought up last time is, does this, how does this map onto bias? Now, I didn't see bias directly qu quoted here in the notes, but to my understanding, <laughs> bias. So to my understanding, bias yeah. is they're gonna get uh, a lot bigger. <laughs> it's like another eight on the plant. To my understanding, bias is um what can happen once you go from the training set to the to the testing data, or once you try to apply your models to the real world or to further examples. And at least in my a naive understanding the reducible error and bias are slightly different concepts and it might not be easily mapped uh, to each other. Where we left off last time uh, was Sure, we could build better and better models, have more and more parameters. And on the left side of the screen, or the left side of the graphs, you could uh, get more flexibility and you could lower your, your metric, namely, usually the mean square error. The issue is that usually you do this only on your training data. And you still have to worry about what happens next when you then apply your model to the testing data. And that's where some of the, some of the bias may come in. And what you'd see on the right side of the graph is, is some of that error arriving from, from the bias. So at least uh, it may be conceptually, theoretically, we're trying to get to the minimum once we consider um, the bias variance trade-off. Oh, I probably should just introduce myself. Hi, my name is Derek Solberger. I teach introductory level data science classes, but admittedly, since I spend most of my time in, at the introductory level, some of these higher ideas are not necessarily in my expertise. So if you have any questions or you want to discuss something more thoroughly, please let me know. Also, in the previous examples that we were going over last week, most of them will talk about uh, regression models or situations where the response variable, what we're trying to predict, is numerical in nature. There will be times when we want to maybe predict something that's uh, more categorical or, or qualitative in nature. And, and that will lead us into the classification, the notion of classification. Yeah. So first consider an identify an indicator function, sorry, an indicator function. If the true value does not match the predicted value, we want to make a note of that. If the true value does not match the predicted value, this becomes a one. If they do match, this becomes a zero. And we add all those times when the predictions did not match. By then dividing over how many observations we have, we essentially take an average, and this is the proportion of predictions that did not match the data. We will call this equation the training data, the training error.
if it's done, of course, with the training set. If we then later go on to the test set, we have a test error rate. And again, we're taking the average of the indicator function, adding up all the misclassifications, and then dividing by n. And as the name implies, if we have error for the training set or if we have error for the testing set, we hope that these are as small as possible uh, up, up to some unknown minimum of the irreducible error. At this point, the textbook goes over the Bayes classifier. Oh, so we'll spend a few minutes here, but your, your previous cohort members wanted to point out this is kind of just a hypothetical idea, just kind of get some ideas in place. And what we do with each observation is to uh, classify or assign it to what's the most likely class. So uh, the way I'm thinking about it in my head is that if you're building a early machine learning model to take a bunch of pictures and decide if each picture had a picture of a cat or a dog, and you uh, have your computer program look at each picture, they're just going to make an educated or very good guess if that's a cat or a dog. The probability that it's a, in each class, cat or dog, would be given by th this formula here, the probability that it's in that class given the observation. This is, of course, a conditional probability. And moving towards the ideas that you have maybe prior notions and updating your notions of probabilities, this is kind of a Bayesian mindset. So the authors of the textbook called this a Bayes classifier. Moving on to something slightly more concrete. Uh, every time I adjust this web page, the goes to the top of the page. Sorry. In this figure. We see some simulated data. Some of them are orange, some of them are blue. And we are um, hypothetically trying to create a machine learning program that classifies them between whether or not they should be orange or should be blue. So in this concept, the Bayes classifier divides this two-dimensional space that into that into orange and blue regions uh, delineated by that purple dashed line. So the idea, of course, is that for the most part, it looks like we have a pretty good job here. Most of the blue dots are on the blue region, most of the orange dots are on the orange region. However, there are some misclassifications if you have You could have a blue dot here in the orange region, or you could have an orange dot here in the blue region. You have those misclassifications. To slightly more formalize this, we're going to say that the Bayes classifier, that is, if we could think about all the possible ways to draw this purple dashed line, that the one with the lowest possible test error rate is called the Bayes error rate. And the overall error rate is think, thought of as the expectation where there might be some optimal classification out there. That is, it does the best job of classifying 
as many points into the orange and blue regions as possible. So that's what we want. We want to have them classified well and for as many points as possible. And then the error rate would be conceptually the opposite, the comp complement. So one minus that expectation of the maximum. For whatever system is going on here, it might not be possible to completely separate the blue and orange dots, to completely separate the observations into their um, actual classes. And because we are not able to completely separate them, this is analogous to the irreducible error that we were discussing last week. So once again, this section on the Bayes classifier at the moment is more of a, a hypothetical, kind of a thought exercise. Uh, people like me, we like to deal with something a little more concrete. So let's actually look at an algorithm called k-nearest neighbors. The idea is if you look at the picture on the left, the black X, we are trying to figure out if that should be orange or, or blue. A is the number of neighbors. We're gonna expand that circle, the so-called neighborhood, until we hit K dots. So say for now, if K was one, from this black circle, we keep, from this black X, we keep um, moving outwards until we reach the closest point, the, the k equals one closest point. And then we say, let's classify the black x with that color. So since when k equals one, since the closest observation is orange, we would say that the black x itself also becomes orange. But as we were briefly discussing last time, or mentioning last time, we might want more flexibility in our machine learning models to reduce bias and to get some more generalizable ideas later. So what K nearest neighbors, you could use a higher number for K. And on the picture on the left, say if you went out to three neighbors, you kept expanding that green circle until you encompass the three closest observations. At that point, from those three, you pick the class, you pick the color that is in the majority. So with three neighbors, that black X is classified as a blue because the majority of the three neighbors are blue. The nice thing about some of these algorithms is that in practice, even some of the simplest algorithms might do pretty well for at least um, get, getting used to some of these ideas of machine learning. I'd like to brag to folks on a Zoom call that I do have multiple monitors, so I can see the chat room. And if you have any questions, just feel free to type them or, or shout out. Now going back to the pictures from the earlier section on the base classifier, if we increase the number of K, that is for each observation, how many neighbors should we look at at a time? It turns out if we have a higher number for K, say 10 in this picture, then you can see that the boundary uh, formed by the black solid line uh, can be, oh, like loosely speaking, more curvaceous in shape or in the parlance of this chapter, more flexible. And as we increase the number for K, it might be the case that we do a better and better job classifying between the orange and blue dots. 
but also keep in mind that these arguments tend to be true just for the training set. On the extremes, here on the left, if we have k equals one neighbor, that is each observation simply gets classified to its nearest neighbor, orange or blue. Uh, we have that boundary there. So I'm, I'm, I might have mixed up what I said like two minutes ago. And then on the right with k equals 100 neighbors, the black solid line becomes uh, less curvaceous. And it's and it's not and it's not flexible. This is all in comparison to the Bayes classifier ideas that we talked about about five minutes ago in when in the purple dashed line. So something we're going to think about for most of this hour is what happens when the number of variables is large. And there's this notion out there called a cursed dimensionality, especially when we talk about distances, when we go beyond two dimensions, three dimensions, and go into many, say, 100 dimensions. The notions of what are close and far uh, might get skewed quite a bit in some of these measurements. And the in our notes we see here that the nearest neighbor methods might be lousy or or inefficient in some sense when we have many many dimensions. And this is kind of a preview because later on in the book, then the question is, well, how do we reduce dimensionality? How do we make those decisions? And we might see that in a later chapter. So of course, when you see examples like this, we look at the k nearest neighbors, see what it can do for some values of k. The next question might come up naturally is, well, how do we choose a value for k? So let's think about that for a bit. We see that, remember, there's a difference between a safe setting of running these algorithms on a training set versus on a test set. Um, there's some details about how this graph was made. The, the horizontal axis is on a bit of a log scale just to kind of get the uh, picture to be a little bit more obvious. The kind of jaggedness or, or appearance of oscillations or just kind of uh, just slightly from the measurement error and it's not that important here. But nevertheless, what we can see is that with the training errors, as we move towards the right, as we increase the amount of neighbors k for the k nearest neighbors algorithm, the training errors do go down. That is to say that the blue dots are indeed called blue, the orange dots are indeed called orange. However, if we then resample, got a slightly different set of blue dots, a slightly different set of orange dots, the testing error and the misclassifications there are not necessarily going away. That they seem to be a bit more constant. In fact, for the test error rate, there is some implied minimum at the moment that in these thoughts so far seem to be irreducible error. So that black dashed line indicates the Bayes error rate, the conceptual minimum of the testing error. Thus, as we use more qu flexible classification methods, 
the training error rate will decline, but the test error rate will not. And that's kind of a preview as well, that we could refine our machine learning models early on in the laboratory setting on the training data. But how do we reassure ourselves that we are robust against bias as we move on to the testing data? And I believe that's going to be featured in a future chapter as well. That actually brings us to the end of chapter two. A lot of this chapter two, um, this was statistical learning, chapter two, statistical learning. Recall that we are going over a, a bunch of definitions. For example, regression versus classification, parametric versus non-parametric, reducible versus irreducible error, and maybe a couple more ideas. A lot of these exercises so far are to kind of get us thinking about some of the consequences of those ideas. In the first exercise, we're going to kind of ask ourselves, what will we generally expect a performance of a flexible statistical learning method to be better or worse than an inflexible method? So first, we consider a, a tall data set with many observations and, but the number of predictors is small. If I'm reading this co correctly, that's many rows, say 10,000 rows, but the number of predictors, the number of columns is small, maybe five columns. Uh, I think here after I'll just say notes document. The notes document notes that a flexible model can take advantage of a large number of observations and make a detailed model. In part B, we're asking about a wide data set. And Lucio, you have a hand up? Uh, yeah, it, yes, in that first question, uh, I, it wasn't quite clear to me why would a uh, non flexible model would be better if, due to having a, a small number of predictors, then maybe in the, in, in the, in the model that we are assume for the parametric method, it's not like we are having a bunch of parameters. So wouldn't a non-flexible method, uh, sorry, a non-flexible model uh, would be better in that case? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure myself. Does anybody else have uh, more context for that? So what we were looking at at some point uh, last week in the pictures, Oops. not in the notes document. Let me see if I could bring up the textbook. So if you could see uh, this uh, pair of diagrams from the textbook, when thinking about linear regression, uh, two-dimensional uh, input space, the response variable on the vertical axis, their argument was that at least for a small um, dimensionality here, 3D space overall, the flexible model on the right could still be useful to to reduce error, to, to try to get close to the dots or uh, data pretty well. It might be hard to see in a visual diagram, but the authors were concerned about the cursed dimensionality and how this argument about flexibility would hold for higher levels, a higher number of dimensions, say like 100 dimensions. I hope that makes some sense there. Okay, so then in part B, it's the opposite of 
part A in the sense the number of predictors is extremely large. So the number of columns in your data set is many numerous and the number of observations is small. This is sometimes called a wide data set. And we're still thinking about the uh, flexible model. Would it be better or worse? And since this might not be an as easy situation to, to handle with machine learning methods, the notes document of uh, people in the previous cohorts noted that you would do some sort of dimensionality reduction such as principal component analysis. We'll try to get ourselves to a situation where we have fewer columns and then essentially apply the ideas from before, such as K nearest neighbors. Part C, ask about nonlinearity. That was kind of the point of the flexible model, we are hoping that something that's more adaptive than say linear regression could capture um, what's literally not part of the linear part <laughs> and hence have less um, irreducible error. In part D, if the error terms have a lot of variance, what would happen? And the notes document implies that we would at, at the least still have an average representation. At least in regression models, the average of the errors is zero or close to zero. Question number two is asking us to reinforce our understanding of what a classification or regression model is, whether or not we are inf interested in inference or prediction. And then finally, um, from each word problem, what's the number of observations n and the number of variables, predictive variables p? Part A, we collect a set of data on the top 500 firms in the United States. For each firm, we record profit, number of employees, industry, and CEO salary. We are interested in understanding which factors affect CEO salary. Salary is a numeric variable. This is a, therefore, this is a regression problem. We are later going to ask ourselves which factors are significant towards salary, and we have these three variables here. So P is three, and the data set was gleaned or extracted from 500 firms, so N is 500. Example B. We are considering launching a new product and wish to know whether it would be a success or failure. We collect data on 20 similar products that were previously launched. For each product, we have recorded whether a success, fa failure, price charge for the product, marketing budget, competition price, and 10 other variables. When you're doing a binary result, looking for success or failure, this is a classification problem. In particular, it's a binary classification problem. The folks in this industry selected 20 similar products. Maybe that's all that's reasonable in that setting. So N is 20. They did have a lot of financial information about that product. Success or failure was the response variable but the predictor variable had 13 um, columns. And that's that, that situation. Example C, 
We are interested in predicting the percent change in the US dollar to euro exchange rate in relation to weekly changes in the world stock markets. Hence, we collect weekly data for all uh, fiscal uh, calendar year 2012. For each week, we record the percent change in the ratio US dollars to euros, the percent change in the United States market, percent change in the British market, and the percent change in the German market. Percentages are numbers. That will be a regression problem. We are predicting a little bit of the future, and we have this information in the near past. So that's four columns. And since there are 52 weeks in a year, N is 52. At least until you like get into the details, like when the markets are open. And number three is going to be a bit more conceptual. We're going to revisit the bias various decomposition. Let me see if I could get this side by side here. We're going to provide a sketch of square bias, variance, training error, test error, and uh, Bayes or irreducible error curves on a single plot as we go from less flexible towards more flexible. So less flexible on the left, more flexible on the right, On the y-axis, we have the error rate kind of combined in some sense. And I believe here we have this. We have bias in blue. We have variance in brown. We have the training mean square errors in yellow. We have the test mean square errors in green. And then the big old constant the irreducible error in black. I'm gonna take another pause here and if people wanna discuss this figure, go for it. Well, one thing at the beginning the in, was the yellow curve. As we get more and more flexible models, we can indeed, indeed reduce the mean square error for the training set there in the yellow curve. However, once we then try to generalize that to the testing set, the green curve, we could see that the mean square error might pick back up, might start increasing again. In the blue curve, we see that the more flexible models reduce bias. That's kind of what the flexible models do. But then the variance of the errors might increase as we see 
um, conceptually demonstrated by the Brown curve. In number four, we're thinking about real life applications. Some of you are already working on machine learning problems yourself. So maybe I'll pause here. And if you are doing something similar, maybe you can answer this in the chat. Describe three real life applications where classification might be useful. Can I answer one example? Yes, please. Okay, so as a part of a machine learning course I'm taking in college right now, a, a real life example would be to to predict the the type of to predict like it's a category for how many uh, kilometers uh, some some fire uh, has destroyed. So uh, based on how many kilometers there is a category, class A, class B, up to class G, to denote like the intensity of such fire. Uh, and with, with the prediction of such category, we are looking to, to, to actually predict uh, based on, on the year of occurrence and, and other parameters uh, in which regions and, and how intense there could be some uh, wildfire in the United States. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I, I come from the Western part of the United States, state of California, and we think of wildfires quite often. And that is definitely some current research that is going on right now. I uh have -huh. another example based on the security industry. Sometimes employees don't, don't go to the work, the place of work. So they try to predict why they are not going to the station they should go. So it could be depending on the salary, it's raining, it's a holiday, number of uniform it has, the distance that they need to commute from their home to the workplace, most in the company, uh, a number of dependents, for example, could be reasons that could could bring some information about why they are not attending the work. Yes, indeed. Um, that's, that's another great example of like of kind of like government and policy as well. I myself um, looking into educational matters. So a classification problem might be whether or not a student sought out extra tutoring at our tutoring center. And some of the factors could be age, uh, whether or not they have to drive to school, uh, their current grade in the class, et cetera. Okay, so then in part B, do we in this audience have any examples of regression where we're predicting kind of a number? What what do you all what are you all working on? Uh, I have in my case the number of likes in a publication, a video, picture. So when it was post, the word user has the post a picture, has a video in the marketing area. Okay, thank you, Angel. Anybody else in the audience have a regression example or maybe something you might be working on in the near future?
Like for instance, I taught a class in sports analytics last semester. And with sports teams, you, as you can imagine, are trying to predict how many times the teams will win or how many um, points the team will score. And did you also bet in real life you see in such model predictions or? Uh, admittedly for myself, I was teaching a really introductory level class and we were doing more of this, going over definitions and whatnot. We did not make anything new just yet, but if anybody wants to see more advanced material about sports analytics, I could refer them in the Slack channel. Is anybody working on anything where clusters would be useful? What do you have? Uh, would be also useful to classify some football players to check which players have similar, uh, similar abilities. So clustering would be useful to take decisions about how to uh, complete the team or substitute somebody. Yes, indeed. Say in uh, football or sometimes so it's called soccer, you have the positions, uh, striker, midfielder, fullback, and maybe that might not be complete with the answer. And like you were saying, if you uh, take their skills, abilities, um, attributes such as run speed, maybe there's a different way to classify the players to think about. In Lucio's example about of uh, fighting wildfires, maybe you could cluster regions uh, where fires might happen. The clusters themselves might not completely align with subdivisions like countries or counties. And knowing where the clustering happens might help you direct the firefighters, the, the people um, dealing with the fires in a more efficient way. We have about 10 minutes left. If there's anything you all want to focus on, just feel free to ask. I think for the next couple of examples, I'll just read them out loud. Yeah, I have a question about the key means arguing. So it just works for numeric variables, right? Or there is a way to use with categorical ones. Huh. I have not thought about that in a while. So yes, uh, the k-means clustering as an algorithm definitely uses numerical values. If you wanted to use categorical values, you could do dummy coding to transform your categories into a bunch of zeros and ones, essentially. You would do that for regression models, but I don't know if I've seen that for k-means. The issue, of course, is that when you have clustering, you have to have some sort of notion of distance in the first place. Most people think of distance as the Pythagorean theorem or the distance formula. And if you have, and if you have the categorical variables, the notion of distance is, is completely different. As with a lot of machine learning, a lot of it is um, just trying it out, see if it works. And what I mean by see if it works is if the mean squared error later on in the process, or later on what we're gonna call cross-validation error um, is lower. But 
sorry, off the top of my head, I don't know if I've seen categorical variables with k-means clustering. Yeah, great, thanks. Number five, what are the advantages or disadvantages of a very flexible approach? So the folks in previous cohorts said very flexible um, models and neural nets require more data. But when you have a lot of data, when you have a lot of columns, it's less interpretable. It's, it's difficult to explain to people, really. Sometimes banks and highly regulated entities prefer simple linear models and decision trees so to explain to management. I've actually heard the opposite at times, that the people who are working on credit card fraud, who are trying to figure out which credit cards were stolen, their models were very complicated, but you cannot explain to someone, oh, it's just because the credit card was uh, used at a certain store or a certain city. The, the computer is picking out reasons that are more complicated than human speech. Describe the difference between parametric and non-parametric. A parametric approach assumes uh, the, the function. Say, for example, a linear regression model assumes a straight line or a flat plane. And then works towards fitting the data with the closest variation. It's more explainable, especially later on when we get to things like p-values of coefficients. However, the parametric models, because we assume a shape in the first place with data that has some noise, some error in it, we will always have some irreducible error and we'll definitely have difficulty achieving the lowest error rate. Number seven has a highly simplified three-dimensional space with uh, six observations, six dots. And the question asks, from the location of the origin, zero, 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 what would be the prediction for Y? Or what would be the prediction? Would it be a red dot, eight, or a green dot? First, there was a notion of computing the distances from the origin. And if k equals one, we look for just the one closest location. And we predict that the next data point, the one at zero, zero, zero is green. However, if k equals two, uh, then k equals three, we have a situation where we have two red observations and one green observation. So the prediction will be red. If the base decision boundary, that was the purple dashed line in the earlier pictures, is highly nonlinear, well, then what would we expect the best value for k to be large or small? We saw in the examples that uh, small values for k that is only focused on a small number of neighbors led to more detailed curves in the boundary. And at the, in this mindset leads to the lowest irreducible error. For folks that are more interested in the coding, I'm sorry, I didn't really need much time for that, but I just want to at least uh, give credit where credit's due, a lot of useful code. The people who made the code in the past, they like did some neat things about reshaping some of the, some of the um, sample statistics, such as here using the skimmer package to do a really nice exploratory data analysis. For the scatter plots and for many of the plots, the textbook used base R, but I do appreciate that you all have used 
ggplot and more recent technologies to make the graphs and produce these results. So for example, the last data set was about the city of Boston in Northeastern United States. It's an old data set, I think about 40 years old, talking about the, the um, housing market and how much it costs to rent in certain areas and whatnot. So say in this example, they highlighted in blue and red where, where the most expensive um, houses and apartments would be for each of the variables. And by having this diagram and having a lot of these visualizations shown all at once, it might be helpful in explaining the materials. <laughs> 